Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. India has recorded the highest daily coronavirus deaths in the world with 912 new fatalities while the infections have crossed 3 million. Brazil has reported 892 deaths in the past 24 hours, bringing the country's tally to over 114,000. Pakistan has registered four new fatalities overnight, the lowest daily death toll since March. Globally, COVID-19 has claimed more than 800,000 lives and infected over 23.2 million people. The US-led international coalition troops have withdrawn from Iraq's Taji military base. In a statement, the coalition said the troops' movement is part of a long-range plan coordinated with the government of Iraq. In recent months, local militias have frequently targeted the base, hurting some of the military personnel there. The Saudi-led coalition forces have destroyed an explosive-laden Houthi drone and a ballistic missile in the Yemeni airspace. Coalition spokesperson Colonel Turki Al-Malki said the ballistic missile was headed towards the city of Jazan. NATO has rejected Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's claim that foreign powers are organizing a build-up of troops on the country's border. Earlier, Lukashenko put the army on high alert to protect its territorial integrity on the western borders. News in detail after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now we'll have the news in detail. India has recorded the highest daily coronavirus deaths in the world, with 912 new fatalities taking its death toll to over 56,700. India's COVID-19 cases have surpassed 3 million, with over 69,000 new infections in a day. Brazil has reported 892 deaths in the past 24 hours, bringing the country's tally to over 114,000. Globally, COVID-19 has claimed more than 803,000 lives and infected over 23.1 million people. More details in this report. Governments across the world are scrambling to contain the second wave of coronavirus. Italy, once the global epicenter of the outbreak, reported nearly 1,100 new cases in a single day after months of encouraging signs of recovery. Meanwhile, South Korea has reported the highest daily rise, nearly 400 cases, since early March. The authorities said tougher social distancing rules may be needed to curb the virus spread. In order to stop the current pandemic scale and spreading speed, face-to-face -face meetings and contacts among people should be refrained. Therefore, we are applying the stage two social distancing rules nationally as of today. In Australia, after weeks of lockdown in Victoria State, new infections and the death toll has gone significantly down. The government is optimistic. Because of the amazing work that Victorians are doing, we will get to the other side of this and then we can begin the, the really important process, that hopeful process. Of, uh, of, of, of trying to repair and I think succeeding in repairing the damage that this pandemic has done. Elsewhere, South Africa has also registered a spike in cases, with most deaths reported in the tourist hotspot of Cape Town. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, COVID-19 daily deaths have dropped to four, the lowest since March. Officials say the recovery rate in the country has exceeded 93%. The health ministry said the active cases in the country are only above 10,000. The ministry said the death toll in the country has reached 6,235. It said just over 590 people tested positive in the past 24 hours, taking the tally to over 292,000. Sindh remains the worst hit province with nearly 128,000 infections, while Punjab has reported over 96,000 cases. Now, Pakistan has rejected the Indian media's propaganda over Islamabad's move to consolidate UN sanctions against proscribed organizations and individuals. On Tuesday, Pakistan imposed curbs on individuals and entities affiliated with the Afghan Taliban, Haqqani Network, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. 
Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zahid Chaudhry said, Indian media reports about Pakistan imposing any new sanctions measures are baseless and misleading. He said the notification is a procedural measure and does not reflect any change in the sanctions list. He said Pakistan issued the order for full compliance with the United Nations Security Council sanctions and to meet its international obligations. Now, political parties of Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir say they will continue their struggle to undo India's unconstitutional move to scrap the region's special autonomous status. In a joint statement, parties said New Delhi's unacceptable steps disempower the, and challenge the basic identity of the Valish people. The parties said they will not stop until they make New Delhi reverting Kashmir status as it existed before 5th of August 2019. The statement said the signatories will remain committed to strive for the restoration of Article 370 and 35A and will reject any division of the state. The political alliance includes the National Conference, Congress and the People's Democratic Party along with former Chief Ministers Farooq Abdullah and Mehbooba Mufti. Another Indian Defence Forces officer has committed suicide inside a camp in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Air Force personnel Inderpal Singh shot himself at an Air Force station on the outskirts of northern Jammu state. The incident raises the number of such deaths among Indian troops deputed in the occupied valley since January 2007. The Defence Ministry revealed Indian Army of 1.2 million personnel recorded 895 suicides in the period from 2010 to 19. Another data shows more than 1,100 defence personnel from the Indian Army, Air Force and Navy committed suicide in the past decade. A former Indian Army officer said, lack of discipline and poor leadership are factors behind the large number of suicides. One of India's most prominent lawyers is facing a Monday deadline to apologise to the Supreme Court or risk jail in a case testing the judiciary's openness to criticism. This has sparked a debate on freedom of speech in the world's largest democracy. Lawyer Prashant Bhushan was found guilty of contempt of attempting to scandalize the entire institution with Twitter posts. Bhushan depicted the country's chief justice on a motorcycle while the court work was curtailed due to COVID-19 pandemic. The Apex Court ordered Bhushan to issue an unconditional apology by Monday. He faces up to six months in jail or a fine of $27 or both if he does not apologize. The top court often hears cases while litigants argue their rights to express themselves in being infringed. Moving on now, the US-led international coalition troops have withdrawn from Iraq's Thaji military base. In a statement, the coalition said the troops' movement is part of a long-range plan coordinated with the government of Iraq. It said Iraqi security forces will take over the garrison after finalizing the handling over equipment and departure of remaining coalition soldiers. The coalition said the latest move marks the eighth transfer of a coalition portion of an Iraqi base back to local forces. In recent months, indigenous militias have frequently targeted the base, hurting some of the military personnel there. Earlier this year, the Iraq's parliament had voted for the departure of foreign troops from Iraq. Now, Hezbollah says it has downed an Israeli drone that violated Lebanon's airspace. In a statement, the group said the unmanned aerial vehicle was downed over Isa Ashab village near the city of Nabati. Israel is yet to issue a statement regarding the incident in the south of Lebanon. In the past, Beirut has repeatedly complained to the UN regarding Tel Aviv's violations of the Lebanese airspace. Beirut said Israel violated Lebanese sovereignty over 370 times at the land frontier, more than 380 times at sea, and more than 250 times in the air between January and May. In Israel, police have detained 30 protesters as thousands gathered outside Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's official residence in Jerusalem. In a statement, the security forces said three officers were injured in the demonstrations. Local media said despite not having a permit, protesters marched towards Balfour Street where the Prime Minister's residence is located. Another 1,000 protesters gathered at Netanyahu's private home in the coastal town of Kaisarea and chanted slogans. This summer outcry denouncing alleged corruption by Netanyahu and the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic have shown little signs of abating. 
Earlier this year, the Prime Minister was indicted on charges of bribery, fraud and breach of trust. Meanwhile, the Saudi-led collision says it has destroyed an explosive-laden Houthi drone and a ballistic missile in Yemeni airspace. Collision spokesperson Colonel Talki Al-Malki said the missile was heading towards the Saudi city of Jazan. The Houthis are yet to issue a statement on the incident. Earlier, the collision forces claimed to have destroyed another Houthi missile and a drone last week. Now, Iran says its defense minister has arrived in Moscow to review issues of mutual interest with his Russian counterpart. The Iran state media said Brigadier General Amir Hatami is visiting Moscow on the invitation of Russian Defense Minister General Sergei Shoigu. The Iranian minister will also visit the 6th International Russian Military and Technological Exhibition. He will focus on ways to further expand the Iran Moscow defense ties. Now, Sudan's Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok Khartoum is ready to cooperate with the International Criminal Court of the Darfur war crimes case. In a televised address, Hamdok said the government will help bring the accused war criminals before the tribunal, including former President Omar al-Bashir. Hamdok also said the country is close to agreeing a peace deal with some rebel groups with a formal announcement expected later this month. He said the country has taken significant strides to be struck off from the U.S. list of states sponsors of terrorism. Hamdok's pledge to cooperate with the International Criminal comes after months of silence from Khartoum. Sudan's designation as a sponsor of terrorism makes it ineligible for debt relief and financing from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. ICC indictment accuses al-Bashir, among other, of war crimes genocide that killing 300,000 people. Now, a key meeting between Mali's military junta and the mediators from a West African regional bloc has ended after just 20 minutes. A delegation from the 15-nation economic community of West African states earlier arrived in the capital, Bamako, for talks. Nigeria's former president, Good Luck Jonathan, led the delegation and said President Kieta was doing very well. The regional bloc has taken a hard line on the coup as it quickly shut borders and suspended financial dealings with Bamako this week. The African Union also suspended Mali's membership, whereas the US, UN and the EU have called for the restoration of constitutional order in the country. Meanwhile, police used tear gas to disperse a group of pro kieta protesters in the capital. Now, the European Union says it saw a new hope for Libya after the country's warring sides declared a ceasefire and vowed to hold nationwide elections. In a declaration on behalf of the EU, Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell described it as a constructive first step. He said the ceasefire announcement demonstrates the determination of Libya's leaders to overcome the current stalemate. Borrell urged concrete actions to enable a permanent ceasefire and a relaunch of the political process. On Friday, the UN-backed government and the rival Eastern-based parliament announced a countrywide ceasefire. Both the warring sides call for parliamentary and presidential elections to be held in March next year. More news coming up after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back now. NATO has rejected claims by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko that foreign powers are organizing a buildup of troops on the country's border. The presidential offices of Lithuania and Poland have also denied such allegations, saying Lukashenko was trying to divert attention from the real issue. Earlier, Lukashenko put the army on a high alert to protect its territorial integrity. Lukashenko also denounced mass protests in Minsk, alleging that Western countries were backing the demonstrators to oust him. Meanwhile, in an interview, opposition leader Sviatlana Shikoshkanaskaya said Belarus was undergoing a change and Lukashenko will have to step down. Shikanoskaya, who is in self-imposed exile in Lithuania, said various world leaders had pledged support to the struggle of the Belarusians. Asking how they can help us, but I understand that they uh, I think they have no right and have no possibility to interfere into internal affairs of our country. And uh, all I asked them is um, supporting the Russian people. 
Belarus has been rocked by mass protests since Lukashenko won a sixth term in office two weeks ago in an election the opposition, the European Union and the US claim was rigged. Now moving on to Russia. Moscow has denied Washington's allegations that Russia meddled in the 2016 presidential election. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova says the final volume of the report by the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee failed to present any facts and evidence. Zakharova said the report repeats claims stated in the Mueller report that Moscow wants to undermine U.S. democracy via cyber espionage. She said Russian interference is a made-up story in the course of domestic U.S. politics. The spokesperson said Moscow regrets the damage done to its ties with Washington and warned the U.S. against spreading anti-Russia myths. Earlier, a U.S. Senate bipartisan probe concluded that Russia helped President Trump's campaign. The inquiry lasted almost three and a half years, much longer than the other investigations. In Colombia, three separate attacks have left at least 17 dead across the country in the regions contested by drug traffickers, criminals and guerrillas. Separate attacks, each reported leaving six people dead, took place in the provinces of Narino and Cauca, while a further five people were also reported killed in Arauca province. President Ivan Duque lamented the deaths in a Twitter message. Now, Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, has welcomed the idea of buying missiles from Iran. He was responding to Colombia's president, Ivan Duque's claim that Venezuela plans to buy missiles from Iran to support armed fighters in Bogota. Speaking at a virtual cabinet meeting, Maduro asked his defense minister to follow up the plan. Maduro said Iran has up-to-date missile technology. The truth is that this idea from the Colombian president is not bad. It had not occurred to me. It had not occurred to us, Padrino. It is a good idea to speak with Iran to see what short, medium and long-range missiles they have and if it is possible, given the great relations we have with Iran, to then buy good missiles so as to reinforce aerial and territorial defenses in Venezuela. Well, Maduro said Venezuela will buy missiles for defense purposes against imperial aggression. Now, moving on, in the United States, police have shot and killed another black man in the state of Louisiana. In a statement, police said the officer shot 31-year-old Trayford Pellerin when he tried to enter a convenience store with a knife. The statement said the victim was taken to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead, while no officers were injured during the incident. Louisiana's American Civil Liberties Union called for an investigation into what it deemed as an act of deadly police violence against a black person. Meanwhile, dozens of Black Lives Matter protesters clashed with police in downtown Charlotte, North Carolina, over the weekend. Police used brutal force as it used an eye irritant to disperse the protesting crowds. Protests against police brutality and racial inequality have not left up since George Floyd's murder in police custody in May. Now, heavy rains and mass flooding in Turkey have ravaged the country's Black Sea region of Gersom. Interior Minister Suleyman Soylu said four people were killed in the floods while 11 were still missing. Soylu said 133 people have been rescued so far as the floods continue to damage buildings and causing vehicles to drift from the roads. He said rescue teams from surrounding provinces as well as the capital Ankara have been mobilized to the area. The authorities say Kanakti Gorel and Dagan Khan districts will continue to receive heavy rainfall in the coming days. Now, the temperature in central and southern Brazil has plummeted to the lowest level in August in years. The country is experiencing rare cold weather due to the combined effects of the polar air front and cold currents. The coastal areas of the southeastern Brazil have been hit by rainstorms. Rio de Janeiro has seen over 125 mm downpour in the past 24 hours. Three meter high huge waves were seen crashing against rocks along the southern coast of Rio de Janeiro. The Brazilian Navy has issued a 36 hour blockade order on the southeast coast, prohibiting any ship from going to sea. Sao Paulo experienced a record low temperature of 8.2 degrees Celsius on Saturday, which was rare in 60 years. Yesterday, the historic cold front has brought snow to parts of the southern cities of Curitiba and Chijucas do Sol. In the U.S., wildfires fueled by high temperatures and ongoing lightning strikes continue to ravage California. 
Now, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection has warned people as the blaze threatens capital Sacramento and San Francisco Bay Area. The wildfires have so far killed six people and incinerated nearly 700 buildings. Cal Fire said new fires are feared to ignite over the weekend as more lightning storms are expected. The fires that started a week ago have destroyed over a million acres of land. Over 14,000 firefighters have been deployed to extinguish the fires in the affected areas. Governor Newsom has urged the residents to evacuate the vulnerable places as soon as possible. China has launched a new optical remote sensing satellite from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center in the country's northwest. The satellite Gao Ofen 905, along with two other multifunctional satellites, was sent into orbit by a Long March 2D carrier rocket. The remote sensing satellite will test its latest technologies, including communications, navigation, and remote sensing. The satellite will also be used to monitor the development of Belt and Road Initiative. The other satellite will carry out tests on the latest information gleaning technology for aircraft and ships. The satellite has been designed and built by China's Academy of the Military Sciences. The launch is 343rd mission of the Long March rocket series of China. Now, all COVID-19 vaccines are designed for the generation of neutralizing antibodies against the novel coronavirus. Yin Vitong, CEO of Sinovac Biotech, says researchers found a kind of protein S which can activate human bodies to produce antibodies. Yin said scientists are developing two major types of vaccines related to the protein S. His, his pharmaceutical company, Sinovac, has created a vaccine which can help people develop COVID-19 antibodies within a month. Small mutations will not affect the vaccine, and the same vaccine can deal with different epidemic strains. In fact, if there is a mutation, it will be a tiny mutation of nucleic acid, which is the mutation of the virus's RNA. But it does not mean that the virus has changed into a different type. The virus itself cannot mutate on such a big scale. Meanwhile, in Germany, scientists have staged a concert experiment to study how big gatherings spread COVID-19. More in this report. Around 1,500 volunteers equipped with tracking gadgets attended an indoor concert in Leipzig, Germany. Researchers want to find out how cultural and sporting events can safely take place without posing a risk to the population amid the coronavirus pandemic. Volunteers were handed protective face masks, typically used in hospitals, and bottles of fluorescent hand sanitizer. We find it important that events can happen again. If we can contribute a bit, then it's good. It's most important to get more insight so that we can come back to normality, to be able to attend concerts, sport events, just to have more layer time. Stefan Moritz, the head of the study, told the news conference after the concert that he was very satisfied with the discipline of the participants. He said results of the study, which is being financed by the states of Saxony and Saxony and Holt, were expected in four to six weeks. Of course, we had to cut back on the fact that it is now only a third of the expected number of people. But I think we can cope with this. I think we have very good data, but not 100% of what we had hoped for. But we have a very good database and we can work with it. Sporting events such as Liverpool's Champions League soccer match against Atletico Madrid and the Cheltenham Festival have been blamed for playing a role in spreading COVID-19. A decision to grant approval for a concert of German singer Sarah Connor with 13,000 attendees on September 4th has faced sharp criticism by virologists and local politicians. Now let's have a look at the weather updates across the globe. Well, that's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.